All right, uh, good evening. We're going to get started, so find a seat. Uh, welcome to Ann Arbor New Tech. I'm Brian Kelly. Uh, I've been hosting this uh, awesome event since 2015, and I'd like to welcome everyone tonight for our special edition with Fast Forward Medical Innovation. Who's here for the first time this evening? Awesome. I love it. Uh, it's even over our normal, it's about 50% every meetup, we get about 50% new attendance. Um, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, we are uh, a meetup group that's been running since 2009. We have over 6,000 members. Uh, last year we had 60 companies pitch. We do this the third Tuesday of every month uh, in usually this room, upstairs, or across the street. And uh, yeah, this is it's a really uh, interesting mix of uh, students, entrepreneurs, developers, folks in marketing, folks who are doing some investing or are just curious about startups. Um, myself personally, I'm a co-founder and CEO at a company called Census in town. Uh, we uh, were a tech transfer spin out just this past fall. And um, I've been working in tech and software companies for about 10 plus years. I moved here in 2012 and Ann Arbor, uh, while there's this little company called Duo Security getting started then that brought me out here, seeing that there was a monthly meetup that actually had a few thousand members in it, told me, okay, I'm coming out here for this one job, but there's actually a fair amount of like startup activity here. And uh, since then it's just grown and it sort of was surreal for me a couple years ago when Doug and Zach and team asked me, said, hey, we need somebody new to take over monthly hosting. So I'm uh, honored to do that. I do it with a whole group of people here, other volunteers that help curate this event every month. Um, and the format, as many of you are probably familiar who read the site, five, we typically do five pitches. Uh, we have four companies pitching tonight, and uh, they go for five minutes. We do five minutes of audience questions. I'll remind you that it's best when you ask your question for the, for the speaker in the form of a question. I know it's really hard, you wanna give advice and you wanna tell them about stuff, there'll be plenty of time to do that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's supposed to be a really interactive event. Um, so what, why, did we, why did we create this meetup? Um, this wasn't my idea, this was a collective of the people who came up with it back in 2009. So Ann Arbor, small city, there's a lot of amazing thinkers and doers here. And um, while like, you're always like two degrees or one degree away from somebody to get a hold of, it's not always obvious where to meet them. So tonight, one thing I'd encourage you to do other than enjoy these pitches is shake the hand, exchange emails with somebody Around you, you might find your future co-founder, uh, a developer you're looking to hire, or maybe just you know a great idea or a friend. Um, uh, Dave said this last month. Um, for for anyone who came out last month, uh, my actually one of my co-founders uh, came out, hosted the previous month, and uh, he said something that I believe: uh, random collisions shape your life. I think everyone can take at least something away from that. That uh, yeah, it's not all all pre-walked pre, um, uh, path, so you're good for coming out here and, and hopefully meeting somebody new. Um, so we've done some of these theme nights in the past uh, with TechArb, uh, we had Techstars Mobility from Detroit, uh, Desai Accelerator, Venture for America, um, and today I'm, I'm pleased uh, to, to welcome Fast Forward Medical Innovation. I'll give you a little brief on them and you're gonna get an overview of the program in a minute. Um, before I get to that, uh, a couple other thank yous. So the Entrepreneurship Clinic at the University of Michigan Law School, Dana Thompson and uh, you know, the director of the clinic and everybody who makes our venue here possible every month, thank you. And A2 Geeks, uh, A2 Geeks is a nonprofit dedicated to making Southeast Mission in Ann Arbor a great place for geeks and creatives to live, work, and play. Roger Rail, down here in the video, Roger donates his time every month and gives us an awesome YouTube output of our pitches every month. So thank you, Roger. Yeah. Um, uh, Doug Song, Zach Steinler, Scott Koshy, David Bloom, there's a whole group of organizers in addition to myself that help curate the speakers every month and make sure that this is a great experience for everyone. Ann Arbor Spark, if you're not familiar with them, they are committed to bringing together organizations and individuals to support the growth of companies and creations of jobs. Um, find AnnArborUSA.org, I think is the, the website. They sponsor our pizza. We'll be on a pizza house tonight afterward. And, uh, oh, if you want to connect with other people in this room virtually, a good place to do that other than the meetup group is our Slack. 
So madeina2.com slash Slack will get you into our team Slack. And there's a couple, probably four or 500 people on there now. Um, all right, fun thing I like to do every month is recommend podcasts. Uh, and I have a special, a, a few to announce tonight. But in particular, uh, where's Leanne? Leanne, throw your hand up. Leanne's right here. So Leanne, uh, fellow you know, interested entrepreneur in Ann Arbor said, man, there's a lot of interesting people around here. I want to start interviewing them. So he created a podcast called Michigan Makers. Launched it a few weeks ago. He's already got five episodes up. Uh, it's, uh, his tag for it is highlight Michigan's entrepreneurs, investors, makers, movers, and shakers. Um, I'm sure he will plug it some more this evening. He's got a sign-up sheet going around if maybe you want to participate on it. But just go search for it on iTunes uh, podcast directory, Michigan Makers. It's really great. Um, now, for my own that I picked, these are sometimes business related, sometimes not. Uh, I've got two recommendations. So you've heard me mention Recode Decode before, Kara Swisher's podcast. Um, specifically, check out the episode she did with uh, Dick, uh, Dick Costello from earlier in January. They did like a series of these, and it's just fun to hear like his personal story. He's got a U of M connection, did the Second City thing in Chicago. Um, so check those out. Another one I'd recommend uh, is uh, Russell Brand has a podcast. I didn't know this. I discovered this recently called Under the Skin. And he did an episode with Sam Harris that I especially appreciate. I've recommended some of Sam Harris's stuff in the past. So I think that's worth listening to. Um, he also did an, uh, an episode five with uh, Yuval uh, Noah Har Harari, the author of Sapiens, that I thought was really terrific. So there's another recommendation for you. Um, our next, if you know anyone that might want to pitch in this in the future, uh, email organizers at a2newtech.org. Well, we have openings starting in May. Uh, the next two months, though, are, are booked up. And uh, our agenda tonight will run until about 8 o'clock. Uh, we'll make time for community announcements. It's one thing I encourage everyone to do. Whether you're looking for a job, you're looking to hire somebody, you want to plug your meetup, uh, you want to plug your company, it's all welcome. Uh, you'll have a chance to address the crowd for a minute uh, after our presentations today. All right, so, um, so with that, I said please silence your phones. If you're gonna tweet, use the hashtag A2NewTech. And um, my, my short introduction to Fast Forward Medical Innovation, and we'll finally get to Joyce, who I'm uh, introducing here. So last October, uh, an, Ann uh, an Ann Arbor New Tech regular, Joe Morrison, is Joe here tonight? Joe is usually here. Joe told me, he said, hey, you gotta meet Connie Chang. She's the managing director of this group called FFMI. Connie and I got together and we said, oh, wow, this sounds like two communities that, yeah, probably won't obviously overlap, but they should. And we're all here together in Ann Arbor. So that was the origin story. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Fast Forward Medical Innovation is an innovation engine that provides research funding and resources to identify, nurture, and accelerate health-related projects with high potential for commercial success. You might think there's already been a lot of that going on in medicine for a while. What, what I was really inspired by is that they're trying to push it earlier, earlier commercialization. Like a lot of times when you're doing uh, a startup in, in uh, the medical or health space, you have to go through many, many years of trials and um, tests before you even get your product to market. Sort of like the anti-lean startup method. So they're trying to say, hey, for some of these things that maybe parts of the product didn't have to be regulated as much, let's try to commercially test the viability earlier. Um, and I obviously think that fits in really well with everything we talk about at New Tech. Um, so I'm, I'm pleased to welcome, uh, to tell us a little more about FFMI, uh, Joyce Lee. So uh, Joyce Lee uh, is a associate professor uh, in the Department of Pedi Pediatrics and Communicable Diseases here at University of Michigan. Um, she's also FFMI's health IT champ. And uh, I recommend you follow her on Twitter. Her, her name is uh, Joyce, J-O-Y-C-L-E-E. -E. And I really like her bio on there. It says, physician, designer, researcher, promoting a maker movement for health. Um, so with that, let's welcome Joyce. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. I, this is kind of a new venue. So um, thanks, for, uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you guys. Um, I just wanted to say that at University of Michigan, we are a pretty large research enterprise. And I think there's this idea that we want to take some of that knowledge and resource and actually turn it into impact and ideas that, that can help patients and families. And so fast forward really represents the bridge um, that goes across that valley of death to try and get 
some of these ideas to actual impact. Um, so we, in addition, try, in addition to, to, to sort of commercialization, we're also just very interested in fostering more of an, uh, I guess, an innovative community at the University of Michigan Medical School, which is focused on innovation, commercialization, and entrepreneurship as a naturally expected academic behavior instead of something that professors or students are not supposed to do. Um, so we actually have five verticals um, in therapeutics, devices, diagnostics, health IT, digital medicine, and new innovators. And I'm, as you mentioned, the, the health IT champion, which is why I'm hosting tonight. Um, but I think we just kind of wanted to give you a sense of sort of type of programs and infrastructure we have to try and increase the innovation kind of earlier in the funnel, right? So this includes education, access to funding and mentors, business development, and also the opportunity to scale as an innovation hub for the state of Michigan. Um, in terms of commercial edu commercialization education, we have the Programs Accelerating commercial Commercialization Education um, that's run by John Servas. Um, this is um, coursework that can help faculty, postdocs, trainees, and students, not just at U of M, but throughout the state. Um, with entrepreneurship education, whether that's kind of design thinking or, dis or customer discovery, all the way to FDA, IP, and making your business case. We also have a really fantastic business development team that helps us connect people with academic or um, um, sort of academic expertise with companies that actually need um, access to that expertise. In addition, sort of they try and foster collaborations between pharma and other types of industry. Um, and we also have an innovation navigator program. So that includes funding, so sort of smaller sources of funding, 25 to 50K, that can really kind of get an idea kind of deeper into the innovation channel. Um, that's called the Michigan Kickstart Award. Um, and then there's also MTRAC, which is a much larger um, uh, award between 100K and 200K, which is really focused on tr trying to get projects with High potential for commercial success to sort of a later stage um, in the ecosystem. And I think a piece of this is not just that there's funding, but there's actual mentorship support and a network um, at the U of M through tech transfer and through sort of collateral connections to the entrepreneurial community. Um, so I just wanted to sort of acknowledge our partners and generous supporters, and I wanted to acknowledge that Kevin Ward and Connie Chang are in the back, uh, director and managing director. Um, uh, so they're sort of running their own little startup inside the the Hemoth of University of Michigan, so. Oh. So we're, we're going to jump right into it. Uh, so first, our first presenter tonight is uh, Balaji Pandian. And uh, Balaji has, has uh, a company called Invenio Imaging, which produces rapid, label-free, interoperative, interoperative there's been a lot of like pronunciation stuff tonight. Uh, his, histology. Um, and he completed his uh, bachelor's in computer science uh, at Harvard in 2015 with a secondary degree in chemistry. Uh, and he's an MD candidate uh, expected graduating in 2019. And then. Still embarrassing notes. Is there a clicker? All right, so we're going to start All right, warm welcome for the Uh So thank you. Uh, this is the first time I've been in front of this audience, and I'm really thankful for all of you to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a fourth-year medical student at U of M. Um, and as you also mentioned, I really loved computer science, worked in the Valley, and really loved, you know, wanted a way to fuse kind of medicine to computer science, and I'm really happy that I came to Michigan because I've been f found enormous number of mentors, ideas, people who are excited to kind of help me get through this. Um, so that being said, I'd like to pitch you Invenio Imaging. Um, this is a project that was started prior to Michigan, but was slowly, quickly picked up by Dr. Daniel Oringer of neurosurgery here. Um, whom I then decided to work in his lab and got involved with the parent company. So neurosurgery, for those who don't know, is really hard. Uh, really, it's rocket science. I, I don't even get it. Uh, cut too much brain out, and well, you cut too much brain out, bad things happen. Cut too little brain out, and the cancer comes back. So one of the ways of kind of delineating that is to take little pieces of brain tissue, run them down to the basement of University Hospital, freeze it, stain it, 
cut it, literally run it to another room, look at it under a microscope from a pathologist, call the operating room and say, hey doc, uh, the pieces from you know, sections two, three, and four still had cancer, keep cutting. But the other side, totally clear, you're good cutting there. This takes about 40 minutes every time you want to do that. And these neurosurgery cases last hours. <clears throat> Eight, 10 hours are like not unheard of to be standing there operating. A portion of the time sitting, waiting for a phone call. So what Invenio Imaging has done is created a intraoperative laser-based technology that will give you that image, that same image that pathology sees in the operating room within several minutes. When you combine, and this combined with kind of an automated PAC system as well as you know, remote analysis means that a pathologist anywhere in the world can read the image from your operating room in several minutes. Combined with some novel technology that we've been doing with uh, convolutional neural networks and automated analysis, we can even get that down to less than a minute, from tissue to a diagnosis in less than a minute. On sections two, three, four are cancerous, from a minute, from 40. So, as I mentioned, neuropathology, here at the University of Michigan, you're getting top elite level care. You're gonna have a neuropathologist looking at your brain cancer, diagnosing every little margin. You know, other places around even Michigan, you know, if you go up north, don't have a licensed neuropathologist reading that. That can be a general pathologist or someone kind of coming in and consulting. But this technology allows us to do a remote read, similar to what some of you might have worked with in radiology, can now be done in pathology. And as I mentioned, some of the work that we've been doing, uh, some of the work that we've been doing with uh, art artificial convolutional neural networks and machine learning has actually been very, very productive. Uh, we published a paper, paper in Nature Biomedical Engineering about a year ago that said that we could make a lesion, non-lesion call at around 99% accuracy. Our ROC curves are truly remarkable. I mean, this for any other test would be a flying success. A 9.98 area under the curve is fantastic. And we think some of this is actually because of the technology that underlies what we're doing. Uh, stimulated Raman histology, as we're calling it, gives you true chemical characteristics of the tissue that it's scanning. Uh, this isn't a stained kind of optical image that you might get from the camera, similar to those that are recording me right now, but true chemical characteristics of bonds that are happening in the tissue. And this, we can also kind of pseudo-color to what pathologists are very familiar with, kind of H&E imaging. You know, with a little bit of training, pathologists can read this tissue just as well as they can read traditional H&E images from frozen sections. Uh, and once again, in our Nature paper that I mentioned, uh, this has been kind of statistically proven that pathologists does equally well on either our Invenio image or a true frozen section. So our company, uh, as we're moving forward now is currently looking for a series B round uh, to start manufacturing for five hospitals around the country that have already expressed great interest in having this at their own institution. Uh, we've been FDA certified as a class one device, which gives us kind of a great leeway and a, a good kind of breather from the rigors of FDA certification. We have tested and are currently testing in the University of Michigan uh, ORs. This is live and working in the operating room right now on real patients. Um, and as I mentioned, this is what a pitch for neurosurgery and kind of delineating cancer margins. But we extrapolate that with more research, with more data sets, with more patients, that we can do this for any kind of oncological surgery. That we can define cancer margins, of course, with work and more research and data across any surgery, which, as you can imagine, has a very high value, both socially as well as economically. Uh, so that being said, uh, kind of all the players that have kind of stake in this, we think will benefit from this technology. Hospitals from more throughput, patients from better care, surgeons from having less time waiting, pathologists for increased uh, frequency and throughput of cases, and we think overall that this is kind of the future of surgical oncology. Thank you. I'm, I'm super impressed. Uh, we have time for questions now. We're going to do five minutes of questions. If you have questions, throw your hand up. We'll stand up and hopefully get your question. Start right over here. Can you talk about the 
You talk a bit about your market. $150 million seems pretty low for neurosurgery um, based on your value proposition. Yeah, absolutely. So this is, as we had pitched it, a kind of subset of neurosurgery. There's a lot of neurosurgical operations. Neurosurgical operations that take out a cancerous tumor in which delineating a margin is important that is currently done in a frozen section is where that number comes from. Okay. Um, you're right. Certainly, it's much higher if you just said neurosurgery in general. Thanks. I'm going to jump in with one. How, how long have you been working on this? How long has this project been going on from kind of inception pre-paper to where it is now? Yeah, absolutely. So the original laser technology stimulated Raman spectroscopy, the physics of which like does not make sense to me in any bit, uh, was founded at Harvard approximately six years ago um, as a purely theoretical paper um, with a small implementation. Uh, in Venio, the company was started a few years ago. I started working for the University of Michigan Neurosurgery Department about three years ago. Um, and have since then kind of spun off some of my software back to the parent company. Um, and I actually intend to go full-time at this company in a few months. Up in the back. Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Jun. And may I ask how did you pass the medical code or medical law that is required by FDA? Great question. So uh, the FDA class one is for the device, uh, currently as it reads to <coughs> in the operating room as well as sending that tissue to a PACS server. Uh, the kind of artificial intelligence, convolutional neural network, et cetera, has not been classified as class one yet. Um, something that we're kind of actively working on getting through FDA certification as we speak. Thank you. Yeah, hey, I'm, I'm curious. Um, it seems like you have a pretty convincing value proposition, and the hospitals and stakeholders, I'm sure, are going to drive adoption from this if they can save the money. But one thing that I'm curious about is any additional training that's required by the surgeon, because it seems like a lot of this would have to do with surgeon preference if they're comfortable using it. Yeah, absolutely. So currently, uh, we, so currently we don't market it as a kind of like decision tool, as a surgeon derived, make clinical decisions based exactly on what comes out. Um, but we imagine, you know, once when more research papers come out, when multi-center studies come out, um, some of which are currently in kind of R1 stage right now, um, that once people are comfortable with this technology that it will get to that level. Uh, but currently, you're right, we, you know, it's meant as a tool that neuropathologists can use to collaborate with a surgeon in the operating room. Stephen. Um, hey, awesome talk. So I'm just curious from a revenue standpoint, is, is the revenue going to be generated from like selling the units or from like an ongoing like cost to use the software? Yeah, so uh, I guess the most truthful answer is we're still kind of figuring it out. Um, there's a few potential revenue streams here from disposables to you know licensing of software to having ongoing support to kind of the traditional medical device uh, revenue stream. How many, how many units Sorry. do you expect each hospital to have? Great question. So for the five hospitals that we're currently uh, working with right now, we would imagine one unit to each of them as we kind of scale up into this R01 multi-center study. Um, but we imagine, you know, down the road that any the number of live active ORs could be this. But also, you could wield the unit, you know, it is a OR safe device, um, you know, with standard sterilization techniques, you could wheel it from one OR to another. Question? Yeah, so um, it's not clear, are you putting any tracer or are you <coughs> actually running Raman spectra on the tissue after the slicing? Or? Yeah, so great question. So this is completely dye-free, label-free, tracer-free. This is raw tissue that you place in our, literally just a, a holder, and our, our uh, laser apparatus will scan it for you. It's true so, Raman spectroscopy. Well, I mean, uh, the fact that, you know, oncosurgery, these issues are not new, and as you have also said, and MRI T1s have already been also utilized. Uh, how does this compare with that? Yeah, so I, if I'm making an assumption here, uh, are you talking about like MRI-assisted operating techniques? So right, so University of Michigan Mott Hospital has an MRI safe operating room that is currently used for neurosurgery cases like this. Because MRI delineates cancer, not cancer, tumor in a brain very well. The problem is your operating costs in an MRI OR are you know, astro astronomical. Uh, the OR itself, tens of millions, operating time, hundreds per minute. So, what, cheaper? But one more which, one, here which one is better technically is the question. In medicine, we need to have reliability. Of course, right. Uh, it's the first question that I would ask as well. And we hope, you know, our multi center study will start paving the way to ask these questions and to ultimately, at the end of the day, say our technology 
has a number needed to treat that's better than the current standard of care is our ultimate goal down the road. Final question. So, uh, I was looking online and it says that Invenio is based in California. Yep. I just wanted to know, is there any reason you moved out of Michigan? Uh, so the laser technology, as I mentioned, was started at Invenio Imaging, um, kind of before Michigan has gotten involved. Uh, but we've served as their primary and kind of sole clinical use site and you know, have spent lots of time working back and forth. Michigan is a co-owner um, of equity as well as many provisional patents and transfers with this startup. I'm just how much money. Yeah, so our Series B is looking for about five million. Uh, we have about two million of that accounted for um, and a lot of my track uh, SBIR will count for a good portion of it, but we are looking for more investors for that Series B. I have Great. Uh, terrific, terrific pitch. Thank you. All right. Uh, moving right along, uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Tammy Chang uh, to tell us about My Voice. Uh, My Voice is a national real time text message poll of youth public opinion. A little bit about Dr. Tammy Chang. She's an assistant professor in the Department of Family Medicine here at the University of Michigan. Um, and she is a practicing family phys physician with a passion for adolescent health. Thank Enjoy you. Too. I'm really bad news, guys. I am not going to be talking about brain surgery. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be talking about new tech, actually. I'm going to be talking about old tech. And I'm actually really, really excited because despite those things, I think that me being here on behalf of my team, actually, um, we have a really high potential to improve the health of Americans. And so I want to tell you a little bit about me. So I'm a family physician and um, I'm a health services researcher, which means I do research to inform policies. So this is my lab, right? Like there's no sl cells or slides or cutting into brains or anything like that. And my, parent, my kid's still like, you're not a doctor. But um, you know, this is really, really great because this is what it looks like. And I'm sitting there. And as a health services researcher, you know, my dreams come true when a politician or a policymaker calls me on the phone, right? Because now I get to inform policies. And this is how it usually plays out. And this is the problem that I'm talking about. For a lot of health services researchers, they'll call and they'll say, Dr. Chang, I have this policy. You know, you're an expert on adolescent health. You know, and then invariably they will ask me very important question, very salient, and I'll say, wow, that's a great question. You know, um, give me six months to a year, I'm gonna do an IRB on that, and I'll have an answer to you in like a year, okay? And they'll be like, Dr. Chang, I'm voting on this on Thursday. You know, that's when we feel like this. That's when health services feel, you know, this is not good. This is a problem. The problem is that there's a disconnect in the timeline it takes to do research, all types of research, and the timeline it takes to create policies that will improve health. So we do not get a good return on investment in most of the research that we do. And so that's why we want to change the way that we do research. And as you heard, I work on, in um, youth and adolescents, so we created My Voice. So My Voice is an interactive text messaging poll that empowers young people 14 to 24 to voice their opinions in real time. So this is what it's about. We recruit people that we consider invisible, the ones that who wouldn't typically sign up for studies, right, on Facebook and Instagram. They are answering about three to five questions on their cell phones, um, and they get a dollar a week. And so what happens is that, um, what we think is that youth are central to every, to, to every major health issue. And a lot of people will say, well, why youth? Why, why are you, do, aren't they healthy? The majority of mental health issues actually present before your age 25, right? Substance use, um, a lot of people experimenting, as you guys know about overdoses, youth and adolescents. Um, habits um, related to nutrition and exercise that lead to um, risk factors for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, those are also established in youth. And of course, reproductive health issues, sex ed issues, which is my specialty, a lot of times we don't begin in use. So if we want to be proactive about health in our country, what we actually need to be doing is focusing more on youth. But a lot of the policies for youth miss the mark, and we think this is not informed by the youth um, perspective. Okay. Another thing a lot of people ask me about is, well, Dr. Chang, you know, aren't there these great national studies about youth out there? Why do you even need to do this? Yeah, there are. You know, the NIH and the government actually collect a lot of information about youth. They're typically closed-ended and analyzed years after the data is collected. 
right? So if you think about it, a lot of times the data is, is analyzed, collected, analyzed, clean, and then like put out there, and the kids are already like 30 or 40, right? That, that's a problem. And the other big thing about these closed-ended responses is that it misses the how, it misses the why. Those are the things that policymakers, every, everybody from like a clinic director to you know, uh, a senator, the how and the why that they need to create programs that are gonna be effective for you. Okay, our motto is always finding the right people, um, getting the right people, getting the right information at the right time. It's very tricky, it's very tricky, and we're working really hard at it. But let me tell you where my voice is now. So we currently have about 1,400 youth across the country, 14 to 24, and what we try to do is benchmark with the American Community Survey. So the American Community Survey is a lot like a yearly census of youth, and we want to try to match them as much as possible, and we're actually doing quite a good job at that. We're, we were surprised that Facebook and Instagram could target that well, but they can't. Um, what we do is we analyze the data with um, mixed methods and with NLP. Natural language processing is awesome because we're getting mountains, like literally mountains, of text data, which is really, really hard for anybody, even students, to like go through, right? If we're talking about 1,400 views, three to five questions a week, right? So we need a little bit of help with that, and, and we're creating these new algorithms that actually can be applied to all types of qualitative research. Some successes. We actually were able to um, submit written testimony in the state of Massachusetts for this House bill. They were really curious about um, whether what you thought about diet pills and muscle building supplements. You know, was this something that they were concerned about? Should we regulate it so that people under 18 can't get them over the counter? And they wanted to know what experts thought, but they also wanted to know what youth thought. <coughs> Long story short, youth <coughs> have concerns about access to this. We also very recently had a lot of news coverage about a survey we did looking at um, stress over time related to the election. Before, during, and after, we asked youth about emotional, physical stress. And they basically across the board said that they're very stressed. And for youth serving um, individuals and organizations like teachers, doctors, counselors, I mean, this is a warning sign to say, wow, these people aren't sleeping well. They're not be able to concentrate. They don't feel like they can do their homework. And we're asking, as we speak, questions about gun control something that's really, really salient um, related to things that have happened recently. So what is my voice thinking about now? You know, this is a really new paradigm. There aren't very many uh, congressmen or even clinic directors, school boards that are used to working with researchers because there just really hasn't been a precedent for that kind of collaboration. And we're working on breaking down some of those barriers. The other thing is we want to be creative about the way that we get money because you know a lot of the way that researchers like health services researchers like me we write big grants but then we're beholden to those organizations be it the government or a foundation and i really like the way they like bunched up the money in these little piles because i mean that's the way it's working for us now is that we get collaborators who are interested in um different issues uh, related to youth and we're able to collaborate with them but we're, we're trying to be creative about that so Really excited to be here. If you have any questions, we've, I've left some paperwork up here, but um, I would love to have any questions. Who would like to kick it off? Questions? Oh, all down here. Okay. So, you're faster than the uh, the big large studies. You know, the, the very complex studies. What is your cycle time for putting together uh, a solid question and getting it out for sampling and collect the results and analyze that? I would say the fastest we could probably do right now is about a month. Um, we could probably cut that down to two weeks if we had a little bit more manpower. And, and that's one of the money issues. If we had a little bit man more manpower, we could actually accelerate the rate of the much, much more quickly. <coughs> We're only, we've only been around with our large sample for 20 weeks. Right, so we're really learning on as we go. But we're very, very excited about this. Anybody who talked to about this, especially policymakers, are really excited. And, and that's, uh, there's a like, very high potential that we think we can change a lot of these, um, the places where we hit the mark. Thank you. Yes? Um, you said that you use social media to reach these youth, right? So <coughs> considering that many people in rural areas often don't have social media, what do you do to make sure that you get all these voices and not just focus on cities where most of the people are generally liberal versus conservative? I love that question. Um, there are definitely access, access issues about like, Wi-Fi, internet access in some very, 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 very rural areas. And you're right, a couple of missing those voices. 
But what's interesting is that even in that sample of 1,400 people, one third actually qualified for free or reduced lunch. So at least the indigent, we feel like we're doing a good job. When we ask about urbanicity, it, the breakdown is very, very close to the American Community Survey. So we don't ever tout the fact that we're nationally representative, because we're not. But we are a national sample, one of the largest national samples of qualitative voices of youth. And so we get, we, we're bothered and open about that, and we just try to go with that. It's a churning sample. There's so much detail about the actual sample that can like, go on forever about. But that's one of the challenges is that, you're right, to sign up, you do have to have internet access, and you also have to have a phone, right? But if you look at um, like the Pew studies, youth who don't have phones, and we're talking about single digits right now. Uh, okay. Hi. Um, I'm interested in the sort of which is pretty easy to answer. Now let's say if you want to go to the open-ended question, how would you design and how would you analyze? Because it's hard to answer it. And if you ask open-ended, the answer would be like pretty long. I love that. We actually really, I would say that 99% of our questions are open-ended. Okay. So the old surveys, the surveys that are done by other groups are open-ended. Ours are open-ended in your life. It's really hard to go through in, in like, out, but one of the things that we've noticed as we compare <coughs> open and closed ended questions as part of our process, and comparing that also to like interviews, right? Like, so you have closed ended questions, you have what we do, and then you have like interviews where you kind of talk to a person who can talk to you back. The thing about text messaging is that what we found is that the, the findings between interviews, which is a lot of times a gold standard to kind of get at the lead of an issue, and text messaging is very, very similar. The only difference is this is way faster and cheaper. Like, they actually think about the question process the question, and then respond. They already be typing a lot. So they're very, very concise, <coughs> but it's almost exactly the same thing as they would be saying in an interview. Like in an interview, they kind of like run along and they kind of like go around and around to get to the issue because the conversation, you don't want to have downtime with like kind of awkward and have to say something back when somebody asks you, but it's asynchronous with text messaging. And we, we find that to be really valuable. Is there anything organic about the information that you're receiving, or is it all funneled down from your perspective to theirs, or is there, is there any organic information that is derived? Give me an example of what you mean by organic. Just the general state, I mean, you're looking for, for mental health and well-being and those fun things. Is there just general information that derives from this system with, that you're now looking for, that you're like, oh, wow, I didn't you know, see that, that survey was intended oh, for? Oh, absolutely. Actually, there's so many examples. I mean, some of them have, like, slow words on my but like we learn so many things because we ask questions, but they just basically tell you what's on their mind. I mean, one of the most benign examples is that we ask them about sleep, and we would we would try all different survey techni uh, techniques, and one of them is like experts say you should sleep eight hours a day. And what do you think about that? And so they'll say things like, well, experts don't make minimum wage, right? Like it's like whoa, you know, this is way deeper <laughs> than like oh, you know, there's a lot of things that they say. And, and we are able to be really nimble about how we use that data to inform, um, sometimes it's to inform clinicians, and sometimes it's, in, it's important to inform the system. Like, wow, this is a problem for the education system or for like business follow-up. I'll just ask you a question. Um, yeah. yeah, that's a similar question. It's like the state of the business. Uh, how, how you, you need change. You need okay. impact. <laughs> <laughs> you should be Yes, yeah. Mm -hmm. we, we, need, we need to have some money to keep going. And you know, part of this is demonstrating the value that my list brings. And so we're really early. So we're trying to demonstrate really high value. So we do everything. Our products range from academic publications to commentaries to, um, you know, to media interviews to infographics to communications to policy makers. And what we have to do is document all of, these, all of the different value that my list can bring. But it's almost like creating a suite of products, like creating a menu for other people. And I think. Um, you know, we're, we're really, we're really, that's one of the challenges. We're really trying to figure out what is the best way to get my voice going. Um, we, I, I do not believe that NIH funding is the way to go, um, but any type of grant funding, if we were to go for it, wants us to focus on one issue. We're just, that's not, we're a program, we're not a project, right? So, um, I can say we're looking at really interesting partnerships and organizations who care about youth, uh, but I love your ideas. We're out of time, and uh, sorry to cut this one off, but thank you so much. Uh, super interesting, right? Like, I think there would be, like, plays for the, the data there itself, even if that wasn't directly 
Um, even if the, the, the constituents who are asking for the survey to be done um, are not able to pay. Okay, nice to meet you. Uh, Michael Moore, welcome. Uh, so Michael's here from Med Kairos. Uh, they make a portable standardized system for determining the accuracy of tissue collection during biopsy. Uh, a little bit about Michael. He's the founder CEO of Med Kairos. He's a second year medical student at the Michigan University of Michigan. And he founded MedKairos based on challenges he observed while working in the hospital. Gotta love that, scratching your own itch. Like, we started up action, well, it's terrific. Uh, did you go in? Okay. Take it away. Yeah, definitely. Well, thank you so much for that intro. And again, my name is Mike Moore. I found a med Kairos and this has uh, been an iterative process over the last couple years and as of October I decided to go full time on this business so I'm excited to tell you about what I've been doing with my time. So imagine for the last three weeks that you felt a lump in your neck. You're concerned so you go to your family doctor who then refers you to a surgeon to have a simple biopsy performed. That surgeon? Hold on. Uh, the clicker is not connected to your laptop but I can make that happen. Do it live. Yep. Okay. That, that surgeon will use a fine needle, like that one, and stick it into your neck to collect <clears throat> tissue. Not the most comfortable procedure. That needle is then sent to a pathologist, and you get to go home and wait. A week later, you receive a call from the hospital, asking you to come back to repeat that procedure, because they're unable to collect adequate tissue the first time around. And so what choice do you have? You go back, you get stuck again, you get to go home and wait again and a second time, and a third. And this kind of waiting is not a rare occurrence. This happens to hundreds of thousands of patients across the country every year. And this is easy for me to imagine because this is what happened to my father back in 2009. He had tonsil cancer, they did three separate biopsies, all of them came back as, we don't know what it is, take him to surgery, we'll find out during surgery. According to the Journal of the American Medical Association, 20% of biopsies with that type of needle fail to collect adequate tissue to make a diagnosis. Now, that is a problem, but we at MedKairos have the solution. Introducing Bioptic. Our automated platform integrates into the current clinical practice cr to create a new standard for biopsy quality assessment. And our process is simple. You take the needle, dispense the tissue under a proprietary bioslide cartridge, smear it, stain it, and insert it into the reader for assessment, as you can see over here. And we had to slow this down over a thousand times for you to be able to appreciate what the software is actually capable of doing. It's going through cell by cell, identifying architecture to be able to say, is this a quality biopsy? And while this is quite beautiful and powerful, the impact it can have on the patient's uh, journey through the healthcare system is also profound. But beyond the, the obvious impact of the patient, we also help hospitals. We save $1.1 million every year in direct costs with having to repeat the biopsy because hospitals are only reimbursed for doing it once. We also improve the patient satisfaction scores, that is a primary criteria of uh, hospital rankings across the country. And for the clinicians, we alleviate time in their day to allow them to have higher earning potentials through more lucrative tasks. And to make this dream a reality, we had to partner with Fleur and Protolabs to produce our cartridge and bioptic unit with off-the-shelf components and injection molded plastics. They quoted our cost of goods to be $1,500 and $7 respectively. We'll be selling the bioptic unit directly to hospitals through our internal sales channels, and through our bioslide cartridge will be through large distributors such as Cardinal Health. But the beauty is that the hospital should be expected to be reimbursed $20 for every bioslide used during the procedure, making the cost of the bioslide a wash for the institution. That being said, our technology pays for itself after 15 procedures. And so what's the market size? We've looked at thyroid cancer first, which can be valued at $235 million with the bottoms up analysis. Looking at the number of thyroid biopsies performed in the United States last year, multiplied by the number of biocide cartridges needed to perform them. Using that same logic across all tissue types, our total market can be valued at $1.1 billion. But that's just in the United States. If taken a global perspective, that enlarges to $9.9 billion, with most of the growth taking place in China, India, and across Europe. And looking at the competition in the space, we have the stick and send method, which is the, the one I've been telling you about. That's the standard of care. 
We have rotostation station where the pathologist literally puts their microscope on a cart and comes into the biopsy suite to manually count the cells at the point of care. And then you have Instapath where they're taking an image of the slide and sending it to a pathologist. But both of the, these solutions are problematic because they're just adding extra work to already overburdened pathology staff. So if I'm looking at these options, it, I, it's pretty clear that Bioptic is the best solution for these issues that's presented to the healthcare system today. And so to get this product into the market space, we're first going to launch this product into three partner institutions, being the University of Michigan, <coughs> Mount Sinai, and MD Anderson. From there, we'll hire my father, Roger Moore, who's the VP of sales for Philips Healthcare, to grow this into 17 additional accounts across the country. And upon that level of traction, we'll launch our inside sales division and partner with industry leaders across the country. And so at this point, we've developed our cartridge software and camera and are validating at the University of Michigan and the Cleveland Clinic. Later this year, we'll launch a multi-institution prospective trial to collect the data to clear the FDA by March of next year. And at that point, we'll launch our product into the thyroid market space. But we're not stopping there. We'll be able to launch iterative uh, software updates to expand the utility of our platform to all of the tissue types shown here, organically generating revenue from already established accounts. And our keys to success boil down to three main points, being our IP security, which we partnered with Wolf Greenfield out in Boston to build a wall around everything that we're developing, and our bioptic unit will also be a data collection hub, giving us proprietary data moving forward. The FDA clearance, most people view as a challenge that you just have to clear to be able to market your product. We're viewing it as a door we can shut behind ourselves. We're partnered with MethodSense and RAA, and they've told us we're a class two device, and they're the ones helping us clear this by March. And then becoming that standard of care, we're partnering with these institutions, which are flagship institutions across the country, to be able to make sure that we are truly establishing that standard. And we're able to do that through the diversity of our team, Andy Kosminski and I are both medical students here at Michigan, but we also have Roger Moore, who's a veteran of the medical device sales space. John Dollar is a serial CFO in the medtech and biotech industry, and our advisory board is backed by serial entrepreneurs and industry experts. And specifically, I want to highlight Dr. Belise, as he's the world's foremost thought leader in pathology informatics. And these companies indicate a general trend for acquisition in our industry, and specifically, you can see it tends to be about 10x revenue. With that being said, our projections show that we should be able to exit at about 150 million uh, by the end of the year 2020. Specifically though, I want to highlight Philips because they're leading the industry in integrating diagnostics into digital pathology. And with our deep understanding of their product por portfolio and where they're moving as a company, we've strategically positioned ourselves for acquisition in the next three to five years. And yes, that'd be great for our company. It'd also be great for every future patient because with our product in the market space, there won't be a second time going back to the hospital. We offer patients the peace of mind of knowing when you expect results, that's what you get. Thank you. Excellent pitch. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to start with questions. Thank you. Just one second for us. Thanks. <laughs> Not really a question, but. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got the future for it. Who would like? Uh, all the way up to Thanks for the talk. Um, so my question is, we just heard a presentation whose technology is trying to phase out kind of like staining and freezing and all this uh, like slide stuff. Yep. How are you going to reconcile kind of your growth with that growth as well? Definitely. So really, if the pathology industry overlaps in many different ways and a lot of things that they're focused really on margins right now. In the future, yes, there will probably be a little bit of butting heads as we continue to grow as companies. But with their focus on margins and ours is biopsy quality assessment, those are completely distinct. So we're not exactly uh, running into each other quite yet. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I, I just assume that like five years down the road, there might be some like competition there. And so. Well, they'll have sold this company by now. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, really, pathologists do love being able to take the slides. It is moving towards a digital marketplace where. Phillips just uh, got their full slide scanner cleared by the FDA, so that is the way that the industry is moving, and we're trying to be able to have our product fit into that flow that's currently taking place. I'm going to add to his. I think that there could be some collaboration because you're both digitally using computer technology to determine the cell type Definitely. and whether or not there's cancerous cells in the biopsy or in the margin, so yes. you guys can talk about yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> So, correct me if I'm, I'm mistaken. Uh, so, your product is a QA tester. Yes. Basically, do the assessment of the biopsy. 
and if it is qualified it would be sent to the pathology lab yes okay so uh, so my question is so what kind of market how many units per hospital do you expect for your QA tested product yeah so we're focused on NCI and COC accredited cancer centers first we expect that to be about eight per center focused on their satellite campuses first because that's where the majority of biopsies are taking place and for cartridges there's about 2.5 million thyroid biopsies performed across the United States each thyroid biopsy would use about three four cartridges With regards to the technology, um, how often does does Mech or does like does your tool say, you know, this was a quality sample and then it ends up turning out not to have been a quality sample? Like, you know, what's what's your sort of error rate on the bad side? Yeah, that I don't have uh, fantastic data on yet. That's part of the prospective study that we'll be launching later on this year. Right now, we're just assessing the, the quality of the software. So okay. that, that's something I don't have. Our ask we're raising seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars to be able to do that clinical validation study, clear to the FDA, and launch our product in its first three institutions. And that's a convertible debt. Are you yeah, I saw also you had mentioned like SBIR grant money and like, do you have a sense of that you already are approved for any of that, um, any of those grants yet, or is that they, they come later, I can't recall from your timeline. Yeah, so that's later. That's over in 2019, and that's gonna help us basically expand this dramatically across all the tissue types. If we're able to get that fast track SBIR from the data that we collect from the thyroid <clears throat> cancer, we'd be able to launch this across all tissue types instead of having this rolled or this monthly rollout as I have projected right now. So the SBIR is really a speed boost for our company. You mentioned about seven hours per unit, I think is the number four protobots for hardware. What else goes into packaging and manufacturing each of your devices? Yeah, so uh, yeah, I can just talk about Okay, so the seven dollars is for the cartridge itself. That's based on the injection molding process, coupled with the uh, we have our specialized slides that have etchings on them, so we have to pay for that as well. Having that all packaged is something we're looking at right now. What that cost would be, but we believe the average would be about seven. As we increase scale, that cost to injection mold would dramatically decrease. So that's our number we're working with right now, just so we can put some numbers on that and see what happens. But uh, so seven dollars for that, and the bioptic unit is based on the cost for the camera predominantly. Everything else is just injection molding to hold that camera in place. How much does that camera cost? What the camera that cost? costs. Uh, so thank you. That's a great question. Uh, it's five hundred dollars for the camera in a unit of one. So we believe we're able to work with Fleur to be able to bring that cost down. It could get down to about two hundred, three hundred dollars per camera. Thank you. I think that's about all the questions we got. Thank you so much. Thank you. Michael here. Uh, yes, this is my other Michael. Just like we just we just roll. Like uh, I didn't meet all the presenters tonight before we got started. We're all good. Uh, so this is Michael Cole. Um, he's going to talk to us about virtual reality and cardiac resuscitation. Um, so Michael's a doctor uh, here, an assistant professor in emergency medicine at U of M, and he's extensive experience in medical education, clinical reasoning, medical simulation. Uh, emergency non-technical skills and particularly involving cardiac resuscitation um, and other critically ill patients. The one-liner on um, his uh, product pitch tonight is a cost-efficient method to effectively train nurses and doctors nationwide to restart patients' hearts. No big deal. Uh, okay, I'll get you started up here. Yeah. Uh, welcome. Let's give him a give him a call. For having me, uh, and uh, thanks um, for the warm uh, welcome. Uh, so my name is Michael Cole, I'm a emergency physician. Uh, my passion is actually helping people in their time of crisis, and uh, and one of the critical times that people have are basically when they are in a hospital and their heart stops. Right? What could anyone imagine as being any worse? Um, uh, what this is called is in hospital cardiac arrest. Very different than out of hospital cardiac arrest in terms of the protocols we follow and actually the errors that we make. Uh, 209,000 incidents per year, almost 600 per day, almost 600 people per day have their hearts stop inside a hospital, okay? And guess what? We stink at restarting those hearts, okay? Um, there's a 25% survival rate. 
of these for these 600 people per day, 25% survive. I am not a math expert. However, that to me means that 75% of people don't make it. Okay. Um, and you know what? The pessimists amongst you may say, "Listen, you know, this is what happens. People are sick, and they are in hospitals, and you know, 75% that's just what happens." But between the very poorest hospital, I'm sorry, poorest in terms of outcomes. And the, the, the hospital with the best outcomes, there's a 42% differential between those outcomes. So what hospital you have your heart attack in, right, will, di will dictate how well, if, whether you walk out of the hospital or not, right? And that's, that's super important. It's not just that, you know, that study. There's lots of basically tons of, tons of evidence that we have that we are not good at this and that we make errors all the time based in teamwork, communication, based in clinical management, and these errors in both of these different fields, teamwork, communication, and management, or knowledge, skills, they both, kill, they, they both end up in patients having poor outcomes. Okay? So just real fast, take a step back. What happens when your heart stops in the hospital? A team comes and rushes to your bedside, and they have to follow certain protocols. These are, these are internationally accepted protocols. Okay? So who do we want to run to our bedside? <laughs> these guys, right? Or I'm not sure how many people remember this. Maybe they should put the new one up. <laughs> These guys, right? You want the A team to come to your bedside and work as a team together to get the job done. And who do you want in terms of knowledge, right? You want someone who really knows what they're doing. In terms of knowing the things necessary to get your heart started again. So how do we train for this? We, we know that basically this requires training. And we know that training actually improves outcomes. So this is the current model. The thing that's down here is our current model of training, right? It is, it, this is going to be known as a 20th century model. <coughs> Of, of teamwork training, cardiac resuscitation, right? You have a mannequin here. These mannequins cost between ninety thousand and one hundred twenty thousand dollars, right? The resource required to run this show, to train this team, to help this fake patient get their heart started again, right? It requires a room. It requires a mannequin. It requires a technician to operate, which is up there. It requires a person, hopefully experienced. And I've been that person tons of times to give feedback, okay, and tell people what they did right and wrong, right? Lots of resources. So current simulation is resource intensive. All the participants have to be in the same room at the same time. That means basically people have to take off work, people have to leave their shifts to train, be able to come in from home. We are very lucky here in Michigan, but a lot of places are community hospitals. People live 20 miles away. People live 20 miles away from Michigan and work here. Nurses, other staff, physicians, okay? So, uh, it, it requires everyone to be the same at the same time, which is a res also resource intensive, and it requires independent review by a third party. Hopefully, who knows what they're doing? Okay. So we stink at getting people's hearts started again. We need to train to get better, but that costs resources at this moment. So what do we have to offer you? <clears throat> the virtual reality for cardiac resuscitation app. It's an, it's, it, this is an educational app. We're not inventing anything in terms of basically new protocols. There's no FDA approval here. It's, it's exempt from FDA approval. What we have to offer you is basically something that trains both knowledge and teamwork skills. We'll talk about how it does that in a minute. Anywhere, anytime. I could be in Hong Kong. You could be in Michigan. I can train someone in Africa. I can train someone in Europe. Okay? They can train me in terms of what they use and what, they're, what skills they, they bring to the table. It's an immersive environment, which proves realism. And we know from studies in, in great traditional simulation that that actually, that actually uh, 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 improves um, um, uh, 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 impact in training. And real-time feedback on knowledge and teamwork performance, it's real-time feedback. And we also use gaming principles to optimize the training. Okay? So this is our model. This is a very simple model. Basically, two people, and actually the, all, the, the, the group we're working with, you could put up to eight people in a room together, doctors and nurses both all working together, and uh, be in the same room at the same time to manage a patient in cardiac arrest. Okay? Uh, they get assessed both on knowledge as well as teamwork. All right? Um, and we have, different, we have various rubrics to, 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 uh, to assess this. Uh, all the technology required to build this is actually already created, uh, and uh, all it requires us to do is basically put our, our, our expertise as a team, which we'll introduce in a minute, uh, along with the base, with the technology to create this this app that's actually mobile based, uh, and you could use on, on uh, uh, any uh, Android based device from your home. Okay, almost finished here. So just real quick, traditional versus virtual simulation. Current medical simulation is resource intensive. 
versus VR, which is much less resource intensive. All you need is your phone and a VR headset. And I think most people in this room may know, 15 or $20 uh, um, uh, for, for basically a plastic case to fit your phone in. By the way, part of presentation is hands off. That's the way we're supposed to train, is hands off. When people touching the patients or the nurses, okay? So, um, and, and yeah, so uh, requires partici all participants to be in the same location at the same time, virtual simulation versus us, uh, virtual reality app. This is to be anywhere, anytime. And again, independent review uh, to assess skills versus real time feedback on both knowledge and teamwork skills, which is what with this app provides automatically. Who's interested? Hospitals. There's over 5,000 hospitals in the country, all, uh, all accredited by JCO, which is a joint commission. Okay? JCO requires training of people that, need, that, that basically restart hearts. They need to be trained. Right now, uh, the training's every two years. The American Heart Association has a new recommendation for training every four to six months. Okay? If we can create, create a low-cost method to provide training to the staff that does this essential care, uh, um, I, it's, it's a no-brainer that it would, it would be adopted. Over, uh, over 600,000 nursing doctors, that, not, not in all the hospitals, over 600,000 nursing doctors that actually provide cardiac arrest care to patients. Okay? Critical care, emergency uh, sur uh, surgery, uh, operating rooms, anesthesia. Okay? Residency training programs. Training over 30,000 residents require training in cardiac arrest care. Medical schools and nursing schools, PA schools, MP schools. Okay? International collaboration and training. All right? And then, of course, patients' care. Right? So this is our team. Uh, uh, the first two people, Michael Cole, Krishan Mahajan, and uh, Michelle Ebersol, uh, we all have a, a um, um, create sense of knowledge in simulation, in clinical reasoning, in, uh, in medical education. Um, uh, and that's kind of what we bring to the table. Uh, the international you know, Larry Kruppen from uh, Learning Health Sciences, he has ex uh, expertise in assessment, uh, as well as clinical reasoning and cognitive, uh, uh, um, uh, cognitive principles that drive uh, care. The Gainful Learning Laboratory, Rachel Lemer and Barry Fishman uh, are both on this project as well. And the coolest thing is that, what I, didn't, what I didn't mention is, you get two scores during this app. You get a knowledge score and a teamwork scare, score. The teamwork score is a peer-to-peer -peer assessment, which we have actually been published uh, regarding uh, other peer-to-peer -peer assessments. And with the scores, you get basically a ranking in the community. You get a ranking inside your hospital. And basically, departments can can basically uh, try to basically go against each other in terms of basically who has better skills. All the feedback gets sent directly to the administration as well. So the administration knows which departments need more assistance and which ones don't. And that's all for regulatory purposes as well. Um, in our simulation center, residency programs in medical school. Uh, we train over a thousand residents every year in the simulation center. And we have buy-in from all these people to, uh, from all these uh, um, uh, different uh, uh, departments to provide people to, to practice this uh, virtual reality app. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much it. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. When you trained everybody in hospitals, uh, have you ever thought of, of, of selling this to people outside the, the direct medical care, like corporations that want to have a team on site that have an AED sitting around? So uh, that, yes, that's out of hospital cardiac arrest. It's much more straightforward. And there are trainers for that, uh, um, but this can be applied to EMS services as well, which is a huge other market that we haven't even touched. Um, uh, and other types of simulation. Once we, once we have a, this is a kind of a novel model in medical education. Once we have a pilot, actually, you know, there's other types of simulation scenarios that will operate from scenarios and other things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a great idea for basic, basic life, uh, you know, basic CPR, you know, basic life support. Yeah, which is kind of different. Great to ask you a question, Jared. Uh, <laughs> other way, I'm honored to have you there. A few years of medical school, but uh, <laughs> what uh, value add does VR have over like a very you know structured uh, multimodal multimedia assessment, similar to what the EHA BLS CPR training currently is? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, immersion, and also the, the, just the feedback, the ability, basically, to, the immersion provides increased realism. Increased realism. Provides, uh, uh, improves the peer-to-peer -peer, um, um, feedback uh, uh, that's 
kind of required for the teamwork assessment, the innovation assessment. Um, that's really what, what would be our offers. Um, it, yeah, uh, over just a 2D screen, do this on a 2D screen with, uh, with multiplayer. Yeah. And if anyone has done VR before, kind of understand it. Really, it's, it, it, if this isn't going to be real, then it's not going to, it's not going to matter. And I've seen it dozens of times in, in terms of the, the traditional simulation. If it's not real to people, then they're not going to be um, 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 uh, uh, they're present to, to, yeah, to really learn. Uh, up here, right? Yeah. So if we uh, if we do stink right now at the resuscitation rates, what metrics will you use to measure success? Uh, absolutely, and we've actually already worked with graduate medical education. Uh, Larry Greffin's Department of uh, Learning Health Sciences, so like, uh, through Larry Greffin's office, to uh, basically to create a uh, uh, research protocol and methods to to um, basically what to develop, develop a non-inferiority -inferior, trial, right? We have uh, uh, a concept that's cheap, that's going to be basically be less resource intensive than what we have now. And we know what we have now works. So all we have to do is basically prove that it's equally uh, efficacious. And, and it's a, it's a no-brainer in terms of basically selling it uh, in terms of large scale, uh, especially places that don't have simulation centers. So, um, you know, so patient outcomes is the ultimate uh, goal in terms of your, your long answer to patient outcomes, but obviously there's a bunch of process measures. How fast patient get the how fast they get the right medication, uh, use communication skills, how it affect our communication skills, and does patient get what they need? <coughs> Question, Sandra? Yeah, um, so mobile VR has like some drawbacks currently in terms of like interaction <coughs> especially and like the accuracy of the interaction. So how are you addressing that in the platform? So the, the company we're working with out of Southeast uh, Michigan, uh, they're actually, they one of, what they do primarily is education, multiplayer educational apps, uh, mobile apps. Uh, um, I've seen them use this before uh, in terms of basically do it in other industries. It's very similar types of um, functionality. Uh, the other thing to remember is, is we don't need it. We don't. We're not playing a first-person shooter. We're not playing like you know. We don't have to do a bunch of grabbing and shooting and walking. Uh, what happens basically is we see a patient on the table. That patient is getting automated CPR. Is what we do in the emergency department now. They get, they get the chest thumped by a machine. And really, what we're focusing on is decision making. Uh, are they making the right decision at the right time? Are they communicating well as a team? And uh, so, are they making decisions correctly? Are those decisions being communicated? And is the care getting to the patient? And that's what really, that's, that's where the errors happen in prior resuscitation. It's in those things. It's not so much in getting, pushing it right through the right time. Uh, sorry, it's not starting an IV or pushing the drug in an IV. It's these decisions. And um, yeah, the decisions are made based on all protocols. So, yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting. Like once you said like they don't do any interaction, it's all about communication. They like click for me. Like, okay, yeah, so this could actually apply here um, and not have some awkward uh, controllers or anything that you need. Right, yeah, sorry to say that, sir. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Oh, final um, one right here. Does JCO have limitations on like what that training needs to be? And if so, how does this experience like align with it? What are some of the challenges there? They're pretty open in terms of basically what, 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 what fulfills that requirement. Right now, it's every two years, uh, ACLS, um, uh, basically it's called advanced cardiac life support. People get certified every two years, uh, and when the AHA knows that's not effective, which is very really short in that time period. Uh, but again, if we can have a, a proof of concept that's effective in providing uh, both effective in, 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 in appropriate instruction and uh, cost effective, again, the hospitals are going to adopt it. And they're going to, you know, you can sit there for 15 minutes in a scenario, get a score, and again, it's, it's, it's yeah, uh, I think it's going to be no brainer. Well, thank you. I hope you all enjoyed the pitches tonight. They were they're exceptional. Um, at this point in our event, uh, we like to do community announcements. So if um, you have another meetup you want to announce, you have a company you're hiring for, you have a project you want to work on, you're looking for some specific kind of talent, you might be, lo or if you're looking for a job, any of those, if you wouldn't mind like lining up uh, maybe along this side, since uh, we've got full house today, people are still on the floor, and come on down in the front and uh, make your announcements to the group. My only ask is you keep it to like under 60 seconds. That usually is fine, but like we have actually had somebody that tried to do like a full pitch before. <laughs> uh, so it's all good. All right. yeah. Okay.
Hi everybody, my name is Angela Kuyava. I'm the managing director of the Desai Accelerator. Back up, too close. Um, <laughs> we run a 16 week program where we help tech enabled startups become externally fundable. We provide $25,000 to $50,000 in funding, world class mentorship from the University of Michigan and beyond. We staff a cohort of interns simultaneously, so and we pay them, so we give you staff to work with while you're in the cohort. Great office space and a number of other resources. Our application for the summer cohort is open right now until March 4th. So if you'd like to be part of this, please apply at decideaccelerator.umich.edu. Thanks. If you were here earlier, Brian mentioned that I started a podcast, and uh, I guess I'll just give you like a little tagline. So the podcast is called Michigan Makers, and uh, in it I interview Michigan's top entrepreneurs, investors, makers, movers and shakers to dive deep into why the comeback of Michigan's economy is inevitable. And so far we have five guests. We launched January 31st. Uh, tomorrow we launch, uh, we drop our next episode with Shelly Sahi of Sahi Cosmetics. We have some really cool guests lined up as well. I'm actually going to Detroit for the next two days to record them. So I'm the really excited. Plug, uh, plug the side, yeah. yeah, the side alum, actually. That's very true. Um, and yeah, if you're interested, I'll write the title. We're on all major platforms, but still pending Spotify approval. So iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Casts, whichever your preference. I also have sign-up sheets. I don't know where those went. They've been circulating around. Um, does anybody does anybody have them? At, like in front of you, there should be like three. If you do, oh, two? Did I miss? Sweet. You got some okay, names. cool, awesome. So just put them up here when you're done. Um, thank you. Thanks. Hi guys, uh, my name is David Nesbitt and I lead sales for Spellbound. Uh, we build tools with augmented reality that transform the pediatric patient experience. Uh, we're in the Spark Building downtown. Right now we're interviewing for three different positions at our company. So one of those is Director of Marketing and Communications. Uh, one is an operational, or sorry, an outreach and support specialist, kind of a mix of sales and customer support. Um, and the last one is Unity developers who um, have experience working in the Unity um, gaming engine. Um, so if you would be a good fit in one of those positions, find me afterwards. Um, or if you know someone who'd be a good um, fit and interested in that space, we'd love to talk to them. Um, you can look us up on the website at spellboundar.com, and our careers link is at the bottom of the page. Thanks, everybody. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Dan Thomas. Uh, my formal education was in mechanical engineering. I worked in that field for about nine years. I didn't know how to program a year ago. I know how to program in Python now. Uh, I, I just uh, finished one contract job, and I was brought back for another, and I'm looking for more work. I find myself drawn to data science. I'll be going to uh, Pizza House. Pizza House afterwards. I'd be happy to show you some of my code. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Prashant Mahajan, and I'm the vice chair for emergency department at University of Michigan. Um, the mission of our department is to create the future for emergency care. I, we are now developing, creating this program for augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality in the ER. And I'm looking for a mid-career developer who's experienced in Unity. So I, you know, we be competing. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but if anyone's interested, we want to expand this growth of augmented, mixed, virtual reality in this whole concept of emergency care. And there is no bounds. You know, you can manage a patient just next to you or all across the world. So that's where we are. All right. Uh, I'm Aaron Reifler. I'm a recent addition to the Office of Postdoctoral Studies at the University of Michigan Medical School. Uh, I just wanted to plug a little event that we're going to be having in October. Um, so just to mark your calendars, it's a postdoc symposium and uh, the organizing committee is going to be reaching out to some area companies and looking for sponsors and it'll be a great opportunity to uh, really get involved with some of the leading area specialists that are looking for that next stop in their career path. So um, just, a, just a little reminder to keep, keep your eye out and ears out for um, more news on this event, which is the postdoc symposium. Um, and it'll be inviting 
our, our neighboring schools from Michigan State, Wayne State, and Toledo, and postdocs from all the institutions will be joining us. It's uh, sort of like a regional outreach event. So thank you all. Hey, everybody. I have a shameless request for you. Um, so my name is Brian Mives. I'm a fourth year med student here at the University of Michigan. My partner has just finished his biomedical engineering master's here at U of M. Um, and he's going to be following me for residency, which graciously enough may be in Los Angeles, which he's not particularly excited about for his interest in biomechanics. Um, so my shameless request here is that if any of you guys have any connections or know of potential opportunities for um, in, sort of entry-level engineering jobs in Los Angeles in the biotech field or particularly in biomechanics, um, let me know. My unique name is G. Ives, and uh, I'll be around for about 45 minutes here. But thank you. Hey everyone, my name is Jonah Ehrlich. I'm a student at the University of Michigan, uh, and I'm the president of Upround Venture Capital. We are a student organization with the very bold goal of accelerating the entrepreneurial ecosystem in southeastern Michigan. Uh, we started really this past fall with a competition where student teams act as investors to assess three real companies in search of funding. Uh, we were happy to host actually Michael Moore from Ed Kairos. Uh, great to see him on stage here. Um, and after that event, we realized there was a real need we were hitting. We decided to expand as an organization. We are actually relaunching tonight um, with three pillars of what we do. Uh, interdisciplinary venture education, engaging the broader venture community with Southeastern Michigan. Uh, we actually have a partner that wants to do three to five investments in the region over the next uh, six months, and creating a stronger sense of community within the entrepreneurial ecosystem, both on campus and in Ann Arbor. Um, I unfortunately can't make it to Pete's house tonight, but we'll be outside after if you're interested in speaking to me at all about anything. Uh, you can find us on social media at UpRoundVC. Um, thank you. company partnerships across South, South East Michigan uh, for an organization called Venture for America. We're an entrepreneurship fellowship program for recent college grads looking for startup jobs in cities like Detroit and sur the surrounding area. So I'll leave flyers up here and be around for a few minutes. Thank you. Hey everyone. <clears throat> My name is David Cohn and I'm a patent agent with Spectrum Intellectual Property. And at Spectrum, what we do is we help inventors in Michigan get patent protection on what they've invented. And I'll tell you a little bit about myself. I've been doing this for about six years. I've worked on patents in computer hardware, computer software, mechanical technology, medical devices, um, a lot of different areas. I also used to be an examiner for the U.S. Patent Office. So while I was there, I picked up a few tips and tricks about what examiners like to see and what they don't like to see when they're deciding whether to grant a patent application, <coughs> whether to grant a patent on someone's application. So at Spectrum, we, by which I mean me, since I'm the only one there, <laughs> we focus on providing affordable patent services to small businesses who couldn't afford to pay hundreds of dollars an hour to hire one of the bigger law firms. So. I'll be around for a while afterwards. Come and find me. Great. Hi, hi, everyone. My name is Ron, and I'm uh, working for Nova Technology, and we are trying to make an app that tries to cure chronic disease using a blend of Eastern and Western medicine. And specifically, the Eastern medicine part comes from the Chinese medicine. And um, we currently have around 2,000 customers, and we're looking for web and mobile developers. And I'll be at Pizza House afterwards. Thanks. Thank you. So, in addition to work with FFMI, I actually lead a collaborative called Health Design by Us, and we're really interested in the integration of um, health patients and the maker movement. So, I'm a diabetologist by trade, and we work with a lot of data. We have patients that have a lot of data, so we're actually hosting a, a kind of like a data tinkering making workshop this weekend with wearables, Adafruit, Arduinos, um, and personalized data. And then we're actually gonna be collaborating with the kind of DIY maker community of patients with diabetes who've gotten all their data to go to the cloud through surreptitious computing methods and then been able to do sort of lots of interesting technologies. So we're gonna try and get the, the real-time diabetes data stream into sort of a continuous stream of really interesting digital uh, prototypes for kids of type one. So come join us. Um, and then look on my Twitter feed if you want to find out information about where the event is. Great. To 
uh, to everyone who made an announcement, thank you for coming up here and doing it. Uh, you can also echo it on the on the meetup if you leave a comment. That'll get emailed to everyone who has RSVP'd tonight. Pro tip. Uh, so if you want to get your, your message out there digitally, please do that. I'll also uh, plug another reminder for uh, our Slack, madeinay2.com slash Slack. Um, and that's also a great place. There's a lot of channels with specific interest areas that you can connect with some of the people you met here and, and also in the greater community. Uh, we will be uh, doing this again next month on March 20th. We already have four confirmed companies uh, that you'll get to hear from. We're back to our like mix of all, all things, not as like, much health and med tech. Uh, if you like this kind of thing, this theme tonight, let me know. Uh, and we'll, we'll try to keep doing more of them. I thought it was terrific. Um, email organizers at a2newtech.org uh, with your pitches for May. I know it seems far out, but we actually have March and April spoken for. And I hope to see a lot of you at Pizza House later tonight. It's on 618 Church Street. Um, I'll be headed over there within 10 minutes. We'll order a bunch of pizzas. If you like, can throw up a hand so I can get a sense of how many people are going over there, and I'll order in advance. All right, awesome. Thank you. Uh, Thanks so much. Uh, I also just like a big thank you to FFMI, um, specifically, uh, you know, uh, Connie. Thank you for thinking about doing this event all the way back uh, last year. Uh, Joyce for the terrific introduction, and Sarah. Sarah here has coordinated like all of these speakers tonight up to the last minute. So thank you so much.